In 1917, the Russians collapsed rapidly on the Eastern Front, and the Germans, to end the situation of fighting on both sides as early as possible, drew troops from the Western Front to reinforce the Eastern Front. France and Britain, seeing the weakening of the German forces on the Western Front, launched several major battles. These attacks, however, not only failed to achieve their objectives, but also caused major losses to the Allies. The French offensive at the Aisne and Champagne, which used more troops and artillery than the Battle of Verdun, was repulsed by the Germans. Not only that, but the huge casualties caused the French to mutiny. In May 1917, British troops attacked Flanders, making little progress, but costing as much as their French allies. The campaign ended in defeat. Since 1916, the Allied generals, after long and desperate battles of attrition and trench warfare, began to think of new ways out. The British turned their attention to their new weapon, the tank. The British army had been putting tanks into battle for more than a year, and at first, the results were amazing. But soon the defects of the tanks became apparent. The artillery-ravaged battlefields of Europe were muddy and difficult to navigate under the influence of weather, and in many places, even tanks had difficulty passing. Although the British have so far put more than a thousand tanks on the battlefield, in each battle, at most, only a few dozen tanks participate the battle, cannot form a battle breakthrough. Fuller, an officer of the British Tank Corps, proposed a plan to concentrate a large number of tanks in the vanguard, together with infantry, artillery, and air power, to launch a surprise attack on the German forces at Cambrai. Henry Hugh Tudor, the commander of the 9th Infantry Division Artillery, also proposed a plan of action based on a sudden, violent, and brief artillery assault. Both of their plans emphasized suddenness, and perhaps a hiccup in the Battle of Arras, conducted in April 1917, inspired British military reformers. On April 11, 1917, the British planned to send infantry, accompanied by three tanks, to attack the village of Moncielli Pru at 5 a.m. The night before the operation, the weather changed suddenly and snow fell, and the British commander ordered a postponement of the attack. The order was communicated to the infantry and artillery, but forgot to communicate to the tank units. The three British tanks struck at exactly 5 o'clock, as originally planned. Little did they know that they would be attacking without artillery and infantry this time. Before all previous attacks, there would be an artillery barrage on the target as preparation, while the artillery preparation would also let the defenders know that an enemy attack was imminent. And this time, the British Army's accident contributed to the first blitzkrieg in the history of the war. The Germans were unaware of the arrival of three British tanks outside the village of Moncielli Pru in the snow and wind. The German defenders inside the village did not realize that the British had attacked the defensive line until the British tanks were in full view. The Germans were caught off guard, and the suddenness was the essence of Blitzkrieg. The German soldiers were scrambled and overwhelmed as the three British tanks advanced down the street using machine guns and cannons along the way to destroy the panicked German soldiers. The three tanks had made their way through the village to the other side. British luck turned to bad luck, as no infantry followed and no one occupied the village, and the three tanks had no choice but to turn back the way they came and fought again. By this time, the Germans had recovered from their initial panic, organized by their officers, and used the terrain to their advantage, attacking the weak tops and rear of the tanks with cluster grenades and armor-piercing bullets called K-Bullet. British tanks with poor visibility were pounded from all sides by the Germans, and soon too were destroyed inside the village. And only one barely managed to kill its way out, but also broke down in the middle of the battlefield 
and was destroyed by German artillery fire. Only one officer survived. This little episode, which begins with a comedy and ends with a tragedy, reveals the true use of tanks in warfare, to use their mobility, protection, and firepower to launch surprise attacks on the enemy, that is, Blitzkrieg. But this example also tells people that, if a tank enters a city without infantry cover, and engages in street fighting, it will become a blind tiger to be slaughtered. Both Fuller's and Dozer's plans were originally only a limited raid, using a new method of warfare. The main reason for choosing the Cambrai area was that the battlefield was hard, suitable for tank groups, and that the front had been quiet for a long time and would likely catch the Germans off guard. The commander of the Third Army, General Julian Bing, combined their plans, but the campaign objective was expanded to become a complete breakthrough of the German Hindenburg Line and control of the area. This ambitious plan ignored the fact that the British Army was severely under-resourced, having failed to recover from the huge losses suffered in Flanders while supporting the faltering Italian army. The British Army did not have enough resources to support the completion of this huge plan. The British battle plan was to concentrate hundreds of tanks and 19 divisions on a 5-kilometer front between the Canal du Nord and the Canal de Saint-Quentin to break through the German lines and take Cambrai. In the north, four divisions of the British 4th Army Corps attacked between Moovers and Havering Court, targeting the area of Flesquiries and Grain Court, followed by a division of the 5th Army Corps as the 2nd Echelon, and against them, three German infantry divisions. In the south, three divisions of the 3rd Army Corps would attack the area of Markoing, Krevkor, and Bonavis. And after the tanks and infantry opened the gap, three cavalry divisions of the British Cavalry Corps would enter through the gap and use the mobility of the cavalry to establish a bridgehead to the Skelt Canal in Misnir. They would be dealing with four infantry divisions in the central and southern part of the German line. Although it appeared that the two sides were not far apart in strength, the British believed that they would win, with their strong tank groups and the advantage of surprise attacks. Within this plan, the tank corps was used as an arrowhead. The British concentrated on three tank brigades, with about 350 tanks, deployed in the area between Havrincourt and La Vacquery. In front of the German line, the Germans laid a continuous barbed wire fence, and the tanks would be responsible for breaking the gaps in the fence to open up the passage. The Germans also dug anti-tank trenches up to 4.8 meters wide in front of the line. In response, British tank units developed a new method, in which they formed their tanks into groups of three, two covering left and right, while the middle one carried large bundles of branches on top, which the tankmen pushed into the deep trenches and then drove across the trenches, covering the infantry 100 yards behind the tanks, through this passageway and into the German lines. In addition to the tanks and artillery, the British mobilized a large number of air forces for cover, and aircraft were directed to attack various German ground targets, a task rarely performed by the air forces of the time in the past, as part of the new British method of warfare. In addition, a large number of British planes circled constantly over the German lines, to cover the British tank units into their intended departure positions and the British went to great lengths to achieve battle suddenness. On November 20, 1917, at 6.20 a.m., the attack begins. British artillery began shelling the German positions. Unlike previous long barrage preparations, this time the British artillery opened the attack with a heavy and short firing to cover the attacking troops as much as possible. The British artillery also fired a large number of smoke shells. The British tanks and infantry started the attack amidst the smoke. The offensive went very well. Within the first few hours, the British broke through most of the German positions and advanced as much as five miles. 
On the right, the British 12th Division took Leto Wood without incident. The 20th Light Cavalry Division quickly captured La Vacary, and captured a bridge across the Canal de Saint Quentin at Masnier. According to the plan, the cavalry would cross this bridge and quickly attack Cambrai. But unfortunately, a British tank tried to cross this bridge, and crushed it. This led to the failure of the cavalry's plan to surprise Cambrai. The good luck of the British looked used up. The 6th Division captured Ribicourt and Marcoing. When they tried to march on Cambrai, they encountered a strong German counterattack, forced to retreat. The biggest losses of the first day came from the 51st Highland Division. They were the only unit that failed to capture the objective on time. They encountered the strongest German resistance of the day when they attacked Flesquieries. Here they ambushed a German artillery unit equipped with 77mm anti-tank field gun. The Germans had been working on a countermeasure after first encountering British tanks in 1915. The Germans found that their 77mm FK97NA field gun could serve as a very good anti-tank gun. So special armor-piercing ammunition was developed, and the artillery was given special training. One such unit of anti-tank artillery was stationed at Flesquieries. The Germans placed their anti-tank gun positions at the base of the reverse slope of a small hill. The British reconnaissance was avoided. When the British tanks climbed the hill, they were completely exposed to the German guns. The German artillery began their hunt. Within 10 minutes or so, 40 British tanks were destroyed. This heavy loss of British tanks. In addition to the German artillery being well trained and carefully laying traps, the commander of the British 51st Division was also to blame. He let his infantry out of contact with the tanks, allowing the German gunners to strike the British tanks without care. If the British tanks had been covered by infantry, the damage would have been much less. The British mobilized their infantry to destroy this German AT artillery unit, but the German resistance continued into the night before the British were crushed. But Flesquieries as German defenders stalled the British offensive. It deprived the British of their greatest advantage, suddenness. On November 20th, the first day of the battle, the British gained great progress. The 62nd Division in the north has attacked near the Bourlin Wood, on the outskirts of Cambrai. On the southern left, the 36th Division reaches the Bapaum Cambrai Road. Cambrai was just ahead. The British had lost 180 tanks on the first day, 65 of them were destroyed, and the others were lost to combat due to mechanical failure and other reasons. British casualties were about 4,000. 4,200 German prisoners were taken. The casualty rate was less than half that of the Third Battle of Ypres. More progress was made in six hours than in the three months of fighting in Flanders. Such tremendous results made the casualty-depleted British rejoice. Churches throughout England rang bells to celebrate this. But the consequences of the British lack of reserve forces began to show. Not only did they not have enough strength to take advantage of the situation to launch a follow-up attack, but even the defense of such a large area of occupation is also quite overstretched. But now having a tiger by the tail, the British army can only continue the battle. Field Marshal Haig, the supreme commander of the British army, ordered his troops to take the Bourlin Ridge with all their might. This ridge was the barrier to Cambrai. It was a key point overlooking Cambrai. 21 and November 22nd, the British 62nd Division fought hard. However, after suffering huge losses, it still could not capture the mountainous area of Bourlin Wood. Not only did the British fail to make progress here, instead, they were squeezed out by the Germans, from both Moovers and Fontaine. When Inerux was also occupied by the Germans, the British attacking the Bourlin Wood were effectively in the middle of a salient. Field Marshal Haig still hoped to take Bourlin Wood, and on November 23rd, 
The British replaced the 62nd Division with the 40th Division, supported by nearly 100 tanks and 430 artillery pieces. The assault on Bulan Ridge continued. And on the mountain, the Germans deployed two divisions in position. The British 40th Division, after three days of heavy attacks and losses of over 4,000 men, finally captured the summit of the Bulan Ridge, but it was soon recaptured by the Germans again. The two sides were locked in a seesaw struggle. 27th, the replenished British 62nd Division re-entered the battle. The last effort was made with the support of 30 tanks, but it was still unable to gain a firm foothold on the summit. The two sides could only hold each other. At the ridgeline, the British reserves were depleted, and they were unable to continue their attack. They had to dig trenches and start defending. At this time, the British occupied a salient about 11 kilometers wide, salient 9 kilometers deep. Directly in front of them was the ridgeline of the Bulan Wood. This salient was surrounded by German troops on three sides, and was difficult to defend. The Germans are rapidly moving additional reinforcements. Prepare to counterattack the British. This salient, however, was the first to bear the brunt. The Germans quickly mobilized 20 divisions and launched a counterattack. The Germans planned to retake the strategic Bulan Wood and drive the British back from the salient. To this end, a feint was also launched in the area of Havrincourt to attract and hold the British 4th Army Corps. The Germans did not just amass superior forces, they also had their new methods of warfare and new weapons. These were the so-called Hoodier Infiltration Tactics. In the new tactics, German battle groups called Stormtroopers replaced the traditional wave attack. The Stormtroopers were composed of experienced volunteer veterans, equipped with submachine guns, flamethrowers, and light mortars. The machine gunners were even equipped with steel flak jackets. Swift and fierce in their assault on the trenches, they swept through the enemy lines like a storm. Against the British tanks, the Germans also developed new weapons and new methods of warfare. In addition to the 77mm field gun, the Germans also developed anti-tank guns and gave specially trained soldiers anti-tank cluster grenades. Facing British tanks, the Germans often used stormtroopers to split and suppress British infantry. The anti-tankers were then left to deal with the British tanks that had a poor line of sight. Many British tanks were destroyed in this way. On November 30th, the German counteroffensive began. Seven divisions of the Eris Group on the Northern Front pounded the British positions on the Bourlin Ridge, in front of the Bulge. The Germans were determined to win. In a short period, they poured a large number of artillery shells on the British line, and combined them with gas attacks. The British also made this the focus of their defense. Early on, four divisions were reinforced to defend this area. Both sides fought hard. A British machine gun position with eight machine guns fired 70,000 rounds in one hour. The stubborn resistance of the British gave the Germans a great deal of killing and wounding, and their losses were enormous. The Royal Newfoundland Regiment, which defended the right flank of the British line, lost 607 men in a single day, and this battalion had only a thousand men in total. The Germans were blocked by the British in the direction of the main attack. Instead, the southern group, which had been acting as a feint, was attacked. Progress was surprisingly smooth, and British defenses were quickly broken. The Germans broke through as far as 13 kilometers, and tended to surround the British at the salient. On December 3rd, Haig ordered the British to retreat from the salient, the Germans took advantage of the situation and pursued them, drove the British from most of the area back to where they were before November 20th. Finally, 
The British held part of the Hindenburg Line around Havering Court, Reby Court, and Flesquieries. Other lands captured in the first part of the battle were lost. The Germans, on the other hand, held an additional territory, south of the Welsh Ridge. Overall, both sides were in a position at Cambrai. It was back to the status quo before the British attack on November 20th. Both sides suffered heavy losses, with 10,042 British dead, and 48,702 wounded, 16,987 captured and missing. Nearly 250 tanks were destroyed or captured. 11,000 German troops and 145 artillery pieces were captured by the British. 8,817 German dead, 22,931 wounded, 22,972 captured or missing. The Germans captured nearly 9,000 British troops and 165 artillery pieces and 70 tanks. In terms of the outcome of the battle, Britain had undoubtedly suffered another defeat. They failed to achieve the objectives of the battle and suffered more losses than the Germans. But from the point of view of the history of the war, the Battle of Cambrai revealed the path of a new military revolution. The army of the future was a highly professional and lean, fully mechanized army. Tanks would be the main weapon, with the cooperation of artillery and air force, play its powerful firepower, mobility, and protection, winning with Blitzkrieg.